Welcome viewers to the panel of experts debrief on the corporate finance case study, The Time Value of Money. Uh, with me in the studio today are Trevor and Peter. Trevor, could you please introduce yourself? Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Trevor Hartley. I'm a qualified chartered accountant. Also, I uh, was a small business owner and an entrepreneur, and I'm now heading up the product development function at uh, the London School of Business and Finance. Thank you. Peter? And I'm Peter Stewart. I've been in training for over 20 years. I've been a subject specialist consultant to ACCA in the field of financial management, uh, and I'm now the corporate training director for LSBF. Hi, and I'm Augustine. Um, I've been a consultant for a long time. I'm also a qualified accountant, so I think we have too many accountants in one room. <laughs> and I'm also a consultant with a private wealth fund. Um, we're going to look at the case study now. Um, but before we begin looking into the case study, Peter will give us an overview of what the time value of money is and how that is important in pension fund management. Oh, yeah. The issue that we've got in British Airways and any, any other organisation that has a defined benefits pension scheme is that Everyone knows how much money has to be paid out in the future, give or take a few variables. In establishing how much money has to be put into the funds at the early stages in order to be able to meet those commitments, the actuaries and others will have done calculations based on an expected cost of capital, a discount rate that takes account of the time value of money. And if we go back 20 years or, or so, you'll find that the pension industry was largely using figures between 6 and 12%, centering in around 9%. Now, that has given a lower present value against those future commitments, which has meant that people have under-provided into the pension funds, leaving us with a deficit now that needs to be filled in, because the actual returns that are being made are 5%, 4% or so, on average, much less than was anticipated all those years ago when the, the schemes were set up. Thank you, Peter. How does this apply to the British Airways in terms of the time value of money and your pension fund? Well, the defined pension fund liability is an obligation from the future which has been brought to the present using the time value of money, time vehicle, if I may use that loosely. Mm. Um, it does create a liability, a future obligation, which is a definition of liability for a company to meet. That liability has a present value because it's been discounted. The discounting is based on actuaries' estimates. If we look into that case, what is the accounting requirement? The accounting requirement is that a company should recognize liabilities based on estimates from actuaries, and that's what's happened here. And that with the addition that the investment returns of British Airways is not performing, just like every other investment in this current climate has created the black hole, the 2.2 billion deficit. And that's what we have on the case study. What do you think, Trevor? I think when you look at the different variables, like you've said, and the different solutions, um, alternative A is looking at two scenarios. Firstly, you've got the 1.8 billion pound reserve, which the board has said is a target. In that, what we're recommending is that 330 million pounds is continued to be paid into the actual pension fund. Uh, and thus, in a situation like that, the pension fund deficit may continue to increase. But you'll have your targeted reserve, which the board set uh, being achieved. Alternative B is looking at the fact that the pension fund reserve, which is in the books of British Airways, actually doesn't have a, re a really realistic meaning. What you need to be doing there is you need to be looking at the proposed merger with uh, Iberia, and you need to be actually saying, you know what we're going to do? We're actually going to allocate more funds across to the annual payment, which will then be looking at increasing the £330 million a year payment to decrease the deficit in the pension fund. Option C is saying, well, guys, let's just look at new assets. So the assets we currently have in the pension fund are not earning sufficient amounts of return. We should look at alternatives whereby the returns could be higher. Those are the three alternatives we're looking at today. Thank you, Trev. Um, personally, um, in my opinion, I think alternative A is the most adequate considering the situation on hand. They have a target. 
reach 1.8 billion. This target has been communicated to the market. The analysts know it, they are expecting it. Investors know it, they are expecting it. The 1.8 billion in reserves, in a way, acts as a cushion. So I think they should try to achieve that target. What do you think, Peter? Well, I think in, there's two sides to it. Um, number one, yeah, you've got the information signal that the board of BA have given to the, the market. And if they're saying we can achieve uh, re reserve figures of 1.8 billion and they fail to do that, it's going to look pretty poor. However, the other side is that even if they do get to reserves of 1.8 which Trevor mentioned as well, is that there's no reassurance at all that that would be sufficient to cover any potential liability in the pension fund, which is operating independently. So I, I think, it, on the one hand, they've made a rod for the backs by saying they have to have the $1.8 billion. On the other hand, even if they do achieve the $1.8 billion, then that deficit just now at 2.2 could, mm -hmm. in a year's time, be 2.5. Mm -hmm. It could be only 1.5. We don't know. I think, I think, Augustine, something which you really need to be considering in this situation is that the annual payments of the £330 million pounds was based on estimates that were done probably four or five years ago. And as Peter mentioned when we started the rates or the discount rates that analysts and actuaries were actually predicting investments to be creating returns at is vastly under what they predicted a couple of years ago, where they were predicting a 9 and possibly even up to 12% return sometime. Mm -hmm. So that £330 million payment on an annual basis is definitely not going to be sufficing in terms of actually achieving the fund value that needs to be achieved when payouts become imminent. Acceptable, yeah, it's not going to suffice, but there's a fact here. We know that historically companies or boards who have taken knee-jerk reactions have always given a negative signal to the market. They've set a policy, the policy should be achieved at least to the end of the year. Then a new policy will be drawn up to say, well, the 1.8 billion is not realistic, let's leave it as it is and increase payments. Um, we're going to look at Alternative 2 now, and Peter will talk to us uh, about Alternative 2. What do you think? Well, Alternative 2 uh, brings into account the points that I was just making, kind of to counter what you were doing, is that we're looking more actively at reducing the pension deficit. Um, despite the fact that I am an accountant, I don't hold a huge amount of faith in a lot of the cosmetic part parts uh, as regards the 1.8 billion sitting there in the reserves. And I'm far more thinking about the cash flow, the future obligations, and trying to make sure that these are met um, as soon as possible and with as little risk as possible. And I just think, you know, we, we shouldn't worry what's in the financial statements so much as we worry about what the, the pension fund is showing. And if there's a 2.2 billion shortfall, then I think a very real step in in rectifying that is to increase the payments into the fund and bring the gap closer together. Okay. I mean, that means what you're saying is ignore the current, the target of 1.8 billion and rather increase the payment into the funds in a way to yeah. catch up. I mean, the reality is the pension deficit is a threat to the major increase the payment in the funds and close the gap. Yeah, I, exactly. I mean, what you've got in the reserves of 1.8 billion does not equal um, a bank account. You know, it's not a cash commitment. Not that there's a huge liability immediately of 1.8 or 2.2 billion, um, but I think it might be just a little bit misleading to people who aren't fully versed with what goes on with pensions and liabilities to say we're okay. We've got a um, reserve figure of 1.8 billion against a pension fund deficit of 1.8 billion, if that were to happen, because you don't still have the cash with which you can meet that liability. Mm -hmm. Trevor, what do you think? Yeah, I think from the perspective that uh, Peter has just mentioned, at the end of the day, when you're looking at the time value of money, that gap uh, between the actual value of what's being contributed towards the pension fund versus the pension fund liability that's being committed to the employees is going to be an ever-increasing gap 
with the current situation as we have it. Where those payments have not been aligned to current discount rates, that gap is just going to continue getting bigger and bigger. And until they actually start increasing their annual payments to start minimizing that gap, the pension fund deficit is going to remain a very sore point on their balance sheet, which I think for any future investment opportunity or merger proposition will be something which they'll have to deal with. So I do agree with what Peter is saying. Okay, so to sum up on alternative B, uh, we're saying ignore the target, it's cosmetic, go for the reality on ground, pay more money into the fund, reduce the deficit and go for the major. We're going to look at alternative C now, and alternative C is quite interesting because it's very ambitious. Trevor, can you talk us through alternative C, please? Look, I think when you're looking at uh, pension fund assets, you need to be looking at what are the returns on those pension fund assets. I think alternative C looks at the approach whereby we say, in terms of the current market, would it be possible for BA to look at alternative pension fund assets that are actually delivering a high return? Because the whole time value of money issue has come in the situation where they were expecting reserves of X, they were achieving reserves of Y, and because of that, they created this pension fund deficit where the money they were investing wasn't leading to the actual asset base they were expecting years down the path. So option C looks at us saying, should we actually be looking to divest in the current assets that we have and reinvest in other assets bearing a higher return? Well, let's face the truth. I mean, in what you just said, the answer is in it itself. Are there any assets out there that can generate the returns that we're looking for? (laughs) There probably are. But would the pension fund trustees be prepared to take the risks that are associated with those returns? I I would love to know Mm. where there are such investments so that I could put my pocket money into them. (laughs) But uh, If they were, even if the pension fund trustees were willing to go into it, even if they were coerced, if I may use that word loosely, the accounting requirements, uh, the regulatory requirements will not allow them to take that move because there are regulations against certain investments that pension funds are not allowed to invest in. And what we're saying is that in order to get a higher return investment in this market, you're going to have to uh, take more risks. And the risk appetite of a pension fund based on regulation itself is actually very prohibiting. So the reality of us being able to access those assets with a high return in uh, current markets is probably incredibly slim, if any. If any, exactly. That's the key word. I think it's almost impossible. That's it. It would be it would be a great solution if feasible. And you know, who's to say that a combination of the solution I proposed, increasing the payments and some focus on your solution might not work. You know, we do have to review what's in our funds regularly to make sure that we're not investing in something that's returning nothing. I think we have a consensus here actually. Uh, the consensus will be the summary of our um, agreed uh, alternative. So we follow Peter's suggestion, increase the payment into the fund <laughs> while ignoring the, the, the cosmetic 1.8 billion target. At the same time, look for alternative better performing assets that regulation allow us to inv- allow British Airways to invest in. In that way, we're achieving both alternative. B and alternative C, but with more focus on alternative B. What do you think? Look, I think that that's uh, that's probably in the scenario, given what we've been given, the facts we've been given would be the way to go. I think uh, looking at the reserve, like you said, obviously if the board sets a specific target of 1.8 billion in reserve and don't reach it, there could be repercussions. But the repercussions of... Um, investors actually looking at BA managing their pension fund deficit and the possibility of the merger going ahead, I think the positive ramifications of that would be far greater. So I'm very happy with option B. Okay. I just have one little caveat uh, or suggestion to make. Uh, In such a situation, it's always better to be seen as taking a deliberate move. So they probably should wait till the year end end to make such uh, an announcement. But in the meantime... This should be communicated to the proposed major partners. Thank you.